Today we're going to be wrapping up our series, looking at the book of First Peter. Uh, we spent a good amount of time just pouring through his letter, looking at uh, the work and the hope that, of Jesus Christ, how we can look to him and the call to live holy in the midst of uh, persecution, in the midst of suffering. And he's covered quite a few different specific aspects, specific uh, times in life or relationships in which we are called to holy living and living out the gospel. And today we're wrapping, looking at his last, uh, his final words of encouragement. We're going to be looking at what he has to say about a universal experience we all have. He's covered several different things about holy living, uh, some that you can relate to, some that we can't like slave to master. Uh, but today he's talking about one, uh, and he'll be talking about quite a few different things, but one in particular that we all experience, and that is anxiety. Anxiety. And he's going to tell us what are we to do with anxiety, why we can't hold on to it. Uh, and there's, to be honest, there's a lot of things for us to be have anxiety about in this world, right? We got things big and small. Sometimes the small things like, what am I going to eat tonight? Am I going to get Domino's? Am I going to get Pop Murphy's? Uh, maybe I have to have a, a talk with somebody that I don't really want to. We got the big things. Sometimes our anxiety is because we have to sit in the midst of watching someone we love uh, come to the end of their life. We have anxiety because we've lost a job. We don't know how we're going to pay our bills. How are we going to tell our spouse and our children about what's happening? We have anxiety maybe because you have to get on stage and talk in front of hundreds of people. Anxiety is something we all experience, but we're not to hold on to anxiety. Peter tells us what we are to do with it. And so I had a question for each of you today. What does it look like when you have anxiety? Like, how does that play out? Because it shows in a lot of different ways, emotional, relational, mental, uh, often physical. For me, one of the ways in which anxiety shows, or it's actually two things that I do together. Like I start like uh, anger, rage, washing the dishes and having conversations under my breath, particularly when anxiety stems out of interpersonal relationship problems. And I have this conversation in my head and I, these conversations are amazing. I have a great arguments and present my case perfectly. I never lose uh, when I argue in my head. But that's how anxiety plays out for me. How does anxiety play out for each one of you? And we have to know what anxiety looks like each, in each of us because unless we recognize it, we, don't, we cannot deal with it. So we're going to look at what Peter has to say about dealing with anxiety. We're going to look at his final greeting, and we're going to cover several different topics that uh, he kind of rapid fires, but are actually really well interconnected. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull it out. Pull to, uh, open up to 1 Peter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 14. So we're going to go through it, and then we're going to comb back and look at all the, the major topics he's covering. So let's get after it. He says in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So he's going to talk about humility. He's going to be looking at anxiety and, and, and God in that anxiety, his role. We're going to go on. Verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So he's talking about suffering. He's talking about the, uh, the real enemy that we do have, Satan, and resisting him. He's going to give us some encouragement in how to do so. He's going to go on in verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he's done through the whole book. He's going to point to how all of this, how we live in anxiety, how we live resisting the devil. He's going to point to the hope found in Jesus Christ. Uh, but after that, he's going to wrap it up. He has his final greeting. And in it, uh, it's kind of like the end of a letter right now from Peter. Well, he has, their, their style was a lot more wordy than that. And I shared at the beginning, uh, I got to open this series. I shared that I would often skip over the beginning. I would also skip over the end too, because I'm like, I don't, I don't have any time for this. This is just a bunch of names. Uh, but we do ourselves a disservice when we do that. He actually has quite a lot in there. But in particular, he has some really interesting things about the historicity of this book. And so we want to take just a moment going through those to share them with you. And we're not going to dig into them like we would our other topics, but we wanted to go through them quickly. Uh, the first, he starts out, verse 12, By Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, 
exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So here's Peter writing, he's talking about Silvanus. And Silvanus is actually uh, the same guy as Silas is. The Silas from uh, the book of Acts that helps and goes and spreads the gospel uh, during that time. And so what this does is it speaks to the interconnectedness of the Bible. Silas shows up in multiple places. He's here assisting Peter writing. But in particular, the importance to this letter is there's been a lot of uh, people in recent times trying to discredit the author's of these books, in particular saying, Peter didn't write this book uh, because it doesn't reflect how Peter would have written it. it it's written uh, by somebody who was highly educated, who had a command of the Greek language, and Peter would not have had either of those. He was a uneducated fisherman from Galilee. And so the writing doesn't really reflect who he was. But what Peter says is he didn't write this by himself. It was the inspired word of God given to him. And then he dictates that to Silas who pens this letter. And Silas, Silas was a highly educated man who had a, an incredible command of the Greek language. So why Peter's writing wouldn't look like this, Silas's would have. So here is Peter working with Silas to write this letter. It's Peter's thoughts and themes that is being edited and helped by Silas. So trying to discredit Peter as if he didn't write it isn't true. This, he's very clear that Silas has assisted him. And he goes on to say, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. So he's talking to him again. Mark is John Mark, another one of the guys from the book of Acts. He's another guy who took the gospel, who's most famous for, unfortunately, his split with Paul where they go their separate ways. But again, here's John Mark showing up again, a guy who is taking the gospel throughout the world. And he talks about she who was at Babylon. There's this code word for the church in Rome. And it's a reminder of the connectedness of the church, that the church that he's writing to is the dispersed church through Anatolia, uh, northern Turkey. And he's saying, hey, your church, your local church is part of the greater church. We're in Rome still. Uh, we're experiencing the same things. We're still one body in Christ. And then he ends, greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And Peter's really challenging us. Several weeks ago, I shared that Peter wrote, and said that, wives, we really have to evaluate how you're addressing your husband. You've got to start calling him Lord. And he's saying to us right now, like, church, you have to evaluate how you're doing greeting times. The handshake and awkward side hug isn't working. You have to start kissing each other on the cheek. Um, and if you didn't catch that, I was joking when I said wives have to call their husbands lords. I'm joking then and now. This is simply cultural. At the time, Roman families would kiss one another on the cheek as a greeting, as a sign of intimacy and familiarity, uh, a sign that they were family. And so what he's doing is telling the church, hey, you are to greet another one like family. You're to view one another, not as just a community of people who share a belief, but family who love and care and support one another. And so we're going to go back through it. We're going to pull out the major themes we see in it. And the first one is this, humble yourself. It's the first two words he writes, humble yourself. And last week we left off, remember this continual train of thought, we left off, Peter wrote talking about the role of elders, but then how do we relate to each other in the church? How do we relate to people in authority? How do we relate to our peers and the people underneath us? And he talks about in those relationships, we are to clothe ourselves with humility. And he's going to continue with that line of thinking. You say, your humility is for one another, but it's also how you are to live in relationship to God. And so he talks about this humility and he draws this line. You're to humble yourselves under God, but he draws this direct line between humble yourselves and, and in relation to all of your anxieties. And I, I, when I read that, I'm like, Peter, that's not, those things don't go together. The solution to anxiety isn't humility. It's, it's, it's peace, right? In my mind, the solution, hum, humility is the solution to pride. That's really what Peter is getting at. That anxiety, particularly the anxieties that we carry with us, are, are a form of pride. And to be clear, when I say anxiety, we're not talking about diagnosed clinical anxiety. That's something very different. The anxiety he's talking about, writing about, is that anxiety that we carry with us, that anxiety about the worries of the worlds that we carry on our shoulders and hold on to tight that really consume our thoughts. 
That's the anxiety he's talking about. And he says, to, we are to humble ourselves in response to our anxieties because anxiety is pride. Because what anxiety does, anxiety says that I am the person responsible for solving and carrying and, and handling all the difficulties of the world. Somehow we put it on our shoulders and think that somehow we're going we're gonna to solve them or just by simply worrying about them and keeping them with us, that we're going to be the solution to them. And the reality of life, the reality of the gospel is we are not meant to be the solution of the world's problems, our problems. That is God's role. When I was a, when I was a young boy in grade school, uh, about third grade, I was deeply, deeply struggling with anxiety. It was eating me alive, right? And I had a lot to be anxious about. There were a lot of things that were causing anxiety. I had anxiety because one of my best friends in first grade was diagnosed with leukemia, and I was watching him and expecting him uh, to die. I, I had anxiety because my dad was a firefighter and I had this really weird picture of my dad's job. It wasn't the picture of his reality where he'd go to work and yeah, he dealt with fires, but mostly you know, automobile accidents or heart attacks. Uh, my picture of my dad's job was the movie Backdraft, right? It was 1991, the movie comes out. So I'm a couple of years after that, I'm a young boy. And, and that's my picture of my dad. Every day he's going to work dealing with massive raging fire after massive raging fire. And he's just, I'm waiting for him to open that door, front door to a building and the, the fire is going to explode on him and it's going to take his life. In fact, I had, a, I had a movie poster up in my bedroom. I had a movie poster of the backdraft and it's this, this picture of the silhouette of a firefighter coming out of this raging inferno. So I had anxiety that I, every time my dad, every third day that my dad would go to the fire station, I, he wasn't going to come back. I had anxiety because my family, my cousins uh, and, and my aunt, they were dealing with the trauma of a, of a dad and husband who had walked out of them to pursue, pursue a music career. I was dealing with anxiety because we were moving houses, that we were leaving my child at home. We were living in a rental. My dad was building a house with a couple of friends. And at the moment, we stayed in a trailer for like a month in between there. Like I was anxious about what our living situation was going to be. I was anxious about everything, just everything. And it, and it was literally eating me alive. I was starting to develop ulcers. In my stomach, I was bleeding into my stomach. They were worried, my parents worried I was going to have to go to the hospital because I was continuing to take the worries about all the things that were really happening around me and I was holding on to them. I was worrying about them so much, thinking like, I have to carry these with me. I have to be responsible for them at like eight years old. And what I was doing is I was putting myself in the place of God. I was saying, I'm Drew, an eight-year-old boy, but I'm, I'm taking on the load that, is only, that only God can carry. And I couldn't move on from this anxiety until I allowed myself to be kid-sized and my parents to be parent-sized and God to be God-sized, the, the one in control of all things who can hold all things. You and I, our shoulders are not broad enough to carry the load of the world, the worries of the world on our shoulders, but God, God is. That's, that's who he is and what he is capable of. We were not created for that. We cannot live in anxiety. And so Peter says, what are you to do in response to this? How do you humble yourselves? What are you going to do with this anxiety? You cast all your anxieties upon him that you have to get rid of those anxieties and God is willing to take them from you or to cast them. And he, he paints this beautiful picture of casting them across the room, right? It's not just handing them to God or kind of putting them on this table right next to you because our, our tendency is to pick them right back up, but to cast them, to, to throw them across the room at God, get them as far away from you as possible. And so what we do with anxiety is we acknowledge the anxiety, the fact that we are anxious. We, we look at what's causing that anxiety, the true root of it, because often we don't know. We, we recognize we're anxious, but we don't know why. We recognize our role in it, and then we get rid of it. We hand it to God. And the truth is, sometimes we just have to keep casting it and casting it and casting it because it comes back. But we're not meant to hold on to the anxiety so that we have. We have to trust God that God is in control. We have to get rid of our unbelief that he has allowed, that he is impotent, that he can't handle it, and so that we have to. We're not God, only God is God. But why can we do this? 
He says that because he cares for you. What a beautiful picture of God. He's a God who cares for you and loves you so much that he doesn't begrudgingly take our anxiety. He says, I want it. Give it to me. Hand all of it that that you have to me. He wants it because he cares for you. What a particular pertinent thing that he's doing, Peter, writing to the church at this time. They're in the midst of, They're in the midst of a society, Roman society, that has uh, this Roman mythology of gods and their Greek counterparts, uh, Zeus, Hera, Aphrodite, Athena, on and on. The gods that the Gentiles were used to, they didn't care about anybody or anything. They were concerned about one thing, and that was themselves and how they were going to gain power. They didn't care about humans. Humans were at best, at best an annoyance a burden that they had to deal with. And here comes for them a God that cares, the one true God that that cares about them in the midst of their suffering and their anxiety. And it was it was it was real for them and it's it's, it's pertinent for us today. We live in in a in a world in a society that tells us nobody cares for you. Nobody cares for you. It's the message so many of us receive from a young age that you may have a couple of close friends, but otherwise nobody cares for you, particularly authority. They don't care about you. I still remember going from grade school to junior high and my teacher telling the class, hey, you guys better get it figured out. You better figure out how to take care of your homework and and get in the class on time because after today, nobody's going to care. Your teachers don't care. The administration doesn't care. And that's the message that so many of us have received since then. The government doesn't care. Politicians don't care. Police don't care. On and on and on. Nobody cares. But God cares. He sees us in the midst of our anxiety and our suffering and says, give it Give it to me because I want to take care of you. And out of this care, he's going to go on. He's going to talk about guarding yourself. He's going to say, even though God cares for you, and this is a lie that I think often Christians believe, that God cares for me, therefore I can live passively because he's going to take care of everything. And he says, Peter's saying, yes, God cares for you so that you can live intently in resisting. And he's going to talk specifically resisting the devil. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. He's talking about how we are living aware of the spiritual battle raging around us. He's going to talk about Satan's role in our life. And he says, be sober-minded. And this this has come up uh, multiple times in this book. Paul would also write about it multiple times. This thing keeps coming up, being sober-minded. And I've heard questions. It came up in my life group. And from what Heather has said, it's come up in all, uh, most of the life groups, any of them that are following along with the sermon series. What does he mean by sober-minded? Because when we say sober, what it means today is not drunk. But he's writing about something bigger than than not being drunk. That's certainly a part of it. But what he's saying is live clear-minded. Live focused not on the worries of today or the things that are in front of you, but focused on the will and the hope found only in God. And so because he cares for us, because he's willing to take our anxiety, we can live sober-minded. So living sober-minded means getting rid of our anxiety. But beyond that, living free of anger, living free of greed and lust and jealousy. That's what he's pointing to. We need to be sober-minded because we're in the midst of a battle. And he says, on top of that, be watchful, be aware that, that Satan is out to get you. He goes on to say, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He says, there is an enemy out for your soul you have to be aware of who wants you to be anxious, who wants you to be focused on everything else. The devil is real. Satan is real, and he desires to destroy you. He he wants to steal, kill, and destroy from you. To be clear, if you're in Christ, the war for your soul is over. He can't take that from you, but the battle for your life today, it still rages on. He still wants to take everything that Christ has for you. He hates you. And he will use any tool that he has to take uh, the life, the, the, the fully alive life that Christ has for us. And so he paints this picture of Satan. And, and 
We want to make sure we have a clear, good theology of Satan. If we're going to resist him, if we're going to be aware and watchful of him, we have to understand Satan fully to, to stand against him. And so here's Satan. And to be clear, Satan is not God's equal counterpart. He's not the same power. He's actually a creation, a fallen creation of God. Everything he does is only possible if God allows it. And he paints this picture of, of Satan as a, as a roaring lion who prowls around. He has to move around. God is omnipresent. He exists outside of time and space. But Satan is a singular creature existing in one place and one time but he's still dangerous and he's not alone. He uses the world. He uses our greatest enemy's sin. He has other demonic forces that he uses against us and we have to be ready to resist them. And he, and he paints this picture that reveals one of the ways in which Satan works. And it's a picture that we don't often see in the Bible. Most of the time we see him as a liar, a manipulator, a dis, the great deceiver. But here he paints this picture of a roaring lion. Satan, one of Satan's tools is intimidation. He wants to intimidate you and me in the midst of our faith. And that's what he's doing at the time of this letter being written. He is, he is behind the persecution that the church is experiencing. Satan desires it greatly. He wants the church to scatter, to be afraid, to be in hiding, to be to worry that if they if they if their faith is acknowledged that they're going to face death, he wants to intimidate. He wants to steal from us in any way possible, and he's not beyond intimidating us to do it. And to resist that, we have to be sober-minded. We have to be watchful. And he continues on, he says, resist them, firm in your faith. You have to remain firm in your faith in the face of intimidation. Stand firm in the faith. We have to stand firm against intimidation. And it's real for us too. We're not experiencing persecution, but we live in the midst of a society that we're often we feel like we can't share our faith. We can't share why we have true hope. We can't share why we act a certain way. We're scared sometimes to, to sit down and pray before a meal in Costco because people might look down upon us. Satan uses intimidation. And he goes on to share another way in which, say, another tool in which Satan uses that we are to resist. He says, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Here he is, Peter in Rome, writing to the church scattered throughout northern Turkey. And he's reminding them that they are one, that they are together. That even though they're not physically in the same spot, there's still one church under Christ. And one of the ways in which Satan attacks us, one of his greatest weapons is isolation. Satan wants you isolated. He wants you to buy into the lie that nobody else has ever experienced what you've experienced. The difficulties, the suffering you're going through, you're by yourself. Nobody's experienced. Nobody understands. Nobody can help for you. Nobody cares. Satan wants you isolated. And here Peter reminds them, you're not isolated God has given us an incredible gift of the church, a family of brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are created to be together, to stick together, to support and encourage and love and sacrifice for one another. Satan wants to take that from us. He wants to believe that you don't have anyone and the church is to stand together. We're basically pack animals. We are strong together, but we're weak alone. Satan wants you alone. And so if you're not in community, I want to encourage you, you have to find community. It's part of the reason we have life groups. We want to build up community for you, to support you. And when you are isolated and you can't engage in community, remember that the church, you are a part of a church family. That the suffering you're experiencing, you're not by yourself. And out of this, out of this, this guarding yourself, as he's done through the entire book, this entire call to holiness, he points back to the gospel. He says, you have to look to hope. All of this casting aside your anxiety, all of living in the face of Satan who wants to destroy you, you have to look to hope. You can't will yourself to it. You have to, you have to look to the gospel. We cannot lose hope. 
And I, I just, I look around the world in, in, in hope. I don't see a lot of hope. I see a distinct lack of hope in the world today. And it's crushing us. We have to have hope. It's interesting. I, I see this lack of hope. I grew up, uh, I was born in 85, so I grew up in the 90s. And I was sold this, whatever else we have, we have hope. Particularly in America, we have hope. We have hope for a better future. That everything's going to be better. That if you work really hard, you'll have something for yourself. And not only will you have it, but it will be better than the people in the past. You'll have a better life than your parents and your parents' parents and the people who come after you. It's going to be better for them. We had a hope that our kids were going to be uh, better educated. They were going to be safer and better cared for. We had hope that the world would reach some sort of peace. We had hope in all things. And what's happening that I've seen is 30 years later, it hasn't taken that long, but now 30 years later, we realized that the hope that the world sold us was a lie. That it was a dream. And the problem with dreams is eventually, eventually you have to wake up from a dream and recognize the reality. We've been sold the world's version of a hope. We've been sold a false gospel, a hope that doesn't exist. It's a hope that Satan wants us to find. He wants to lie and manipulate us. But when we are in Christ, we have true hope. It's not hope that's a lie, but hope that is a promise. A hope that he has been carrying out since creation, since the fall of man. He promised he would come back, that he would, to put it succinctly, he would redeem us to him. And he's been enacting that and carrying that out in, in, in his coming, his second coming. He has a promise. His hope is a promise that doesn't look anything like hope that we can find anywhere else. He talks about after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Peter writes and says, you have a hope to look to. That yes, you're in the midst of suffering and it will last a little while. And, and he's talking that this suffering, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's a little while. That it may be for a short period of time. It may be the suffering, the persecution they experience may be till the end of their life. It may be the suffering that we go through, whether it's persecution in the future or just the general suffering that we experience. There is a time limit to it because eventually God's promise and hope is that we will have eternity with him, that we will share in the glory of Christ. And we're to look towards that. Take our eyes off the present situation and focus on Christ and the glory for eternity that we get to share in with him. He goes on to say, well, Christ will has himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That he is carrying out his promise right now. That at some point, whether it's in this life or after your life is over, he will restore you fully to him. He will heal you fully. You will have new bodies with him. That he will confirm and strengthen. Confirm just means support. He will support and strengthen you in the midst of your suffering. That the hope we have in the gospel, the, the gospel isn't a detour around suffering. It's the gospel is what strengthens us through it, that Jesus doesn't abandon us while we are struggling and suffering. He's right there in it with us. He's willing to carry the load. He's willing to carry the anxiety as we go through life. And ultimately, he will establish you. You will be established as sons and daughters of the eternal King, our creator and savior, and we are heirs to his kingdom. That is the promise that we have that we can take hope in that the world doesn't have. And to be honest, what the world needs, they don't need a hope to a better, a better world. They need hope to Christ. That's what the church is supposed to be, to be giving to other people. We're pointing them to a hope. And he ends this before his final greetings to say, to him be the dominion forever and ever, amen. It's this cool little reminder 
that they're living under the dominion of Nero in Rome, a uh, uh, dominion, uh, an authority that seeks to crush and kill them. But ultimately, that authority is under the dominion of God. And it will reign forever and ever. He has all authority and dominion and sovereignty for all time. And there's one last thing, though, that we see in this passage. It's found in that end that I would often skip over. And it, it, this is part of why it's a mistake. He has some important importance in there, that final greeting. He kind of just slips it in, but it's a reminder of what we've been talking about through this entire book. It's this idea of stand in grace. He says, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Everything he's been writing about, this this, this holy living, this call to holy living in the midst of persecution and suffering. It's all built on this foundation of the grace of God. That we're not called to holy living simply by willing it out of us or, or just being better, but by being rooted in gospel living and about looking towards the hope, looking towards the grace of God. That's what we have to stand firm in. That's what this whole letter was about. A living hope found in God through the grace of God that you and I can stand firm in. Thanks to you guys for joining us today. I'm going to release the campus pastors. I hope this, this time we've spent in First Peter has been uh, as helpful to you as it was for me, as challenging. Uh, I love you guys. Bye. Thanks for sticking around. Today's transformational moment, we have a couple of questions, and we want to kind of go back to the beginning of this passage, looking at uh, this anxiety that we're to cast aside. Right? And Peter has given us the, the, what we are to do with our anxiety, uh, but there's a process we have to go through before we get there. And I mentioned it kind of in my intro about what, this question that, that I'm asking you. Do you know when you are anxious? Do you recognize the signs that you are experiencing anxiety, right? I talked about my, that rage cleaning the dishes, or mumbling under my breath, having those conversations with myself. Uh, but there's a lot, there's a lot of different ways in which anxiety presents itself, right? It can be that racing mind or, or in contrast to that, that mind that is hyper-focused on one specific thing. It can be uh, that, that um, snappiness, in relationship with other people. It can play out physically. It can be sweaty palms. It can be a tightness of your chest. It can go on and on. Do you know when you are anxious? If we're to cast aside our anxiety, uh, we have to recognize that we are experiencing anxiety to be able to cast, this, to cast it aside. So do you recognize when you are anxious? And the second thing is, what do you do once you recognize you're anxious? Not, not what does the Bible say, but what do you do when you recognize you're anxious? Do you just cling on to it? I think that's what a lot of us do. I like cling on to that anxiety, hold it close, allow it to, 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 to guide our actions. That's what I often do when I'm not living right is I allow that anxiety to be my master. So what do you do once you recognize you're anxious? And how can you replace that with Peter's biblical model? Thank you guys. Have a great day.